Welcome to all of you to Hafıza Merkezi Berlin's uh, live event series, the local struggles, transnational strategies, experiences from Poland and Turkey. The second live event is organized in collaboration with Hafıza Merkezi and its sister organization, Hafıza Merkezi Berlin. Um, Hafıza Merkezi was established in Istanbul in two, uh, 2012 and works on coming to terms with the past and present gross human rights violations, peace advocacy, and defending human rights defenders in Turkey. Hafıza Merkezi Berlin was established around two years ago in Berlin with the aim to engage more directly with the international human rights region. As you all know, last decade has um, seen an increasingly alarming trend uh, on the erosion of the rule of law and a setback in human rights at a global scale. Hafıza Merkezi Berlin wants to develop a transnational perspective with uh, all this uh, global backlash and is willing to promote human rights in alliance with other international actors. When Hafıza Merkezi Berlin Uh, first started its activities this summer, um, our colleagues choose Poland uh, as a country example to discuss in comparison with Turkey. They organized close workshops where civil society actors from both countries uh, came together to discuss similarities as well as differences in threats and share their strategies. Well, this live event is uh, following the second workshop we uh, held yesterday, where around 12 lawyers and human rights activists came together. And we are hosting this live event on this very Human Rights Day, the day the, Interna the uh, United Nations General Assembly adopted the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948. The Universal Declaration was a milestone and we have come a long way since then. The road is ro long and narrow, we know. And uh, as we are together uh, today, virtually, uh, we need to build back better by ensuring human rights are still central to the efforts. On this day, uh, under the UN Human Rights General call to action stand up for human rights we will explore on the promise of justice and international law together with our panelists Malgorjeta Shuleka and Kerem Altparmak. Malgorjeta Shuleka is the head of advocacy at Helsinki Foundation for Human Rights in Warsaw, Poland. Malgorzata also have been documenting the rule of law crisis in Poland by publishing numerous briefs and reports concerning the work of the judiciary system in times of reforms and attacks on judges and pro prosecutors. She is a member of the boards of Polish and international organizations such as Foundation Action, Democracy and Civil uh, Li Liberties Union for Europe. She is also a member of the Warsaw Board. Kerem Altıparmak, uh, former faculty member of the Ankara University, Faculty of Pol uh, Political Science and the director of the Human Rights Center thereof. He has been working in a number of human rights projects with various human rights uh, NGOs. Currently, he is practicing law also and chair of the Ankara Bar Association's Human Rights Center and the legal program consultant for Europe and Central Asia of the International Commission of jurists. Welcome both. As the title suggests, this panel will address the issues surrounding the recent backlash, both in Poland and Turkey. Sure, uh, it's not limited with these countries. In the rule of law, with a specific focus um, on the undermining of legal mechanisms. At the outset, it's important to recall and consider the both countries' diverse uh, historical background and their engagement with the international organizations, mechanisms. However, today we aim uh, to look closer to the promise of justice and international law in relation to current globally shared challenges, challenges to this end to facilitate exchange. 
Uh, well, democracy and the rule of law are facing a serious, sharp crisis for quite some time. Unlike the 20th century, uh, today the elected leaders are contesting democracy and human rights. And despite their geographical, uh, economical, ideological, as well as political diversity, these regimes have uh, common traits. As well, uh, they have developed methods and discourse to resha reshape the understanding of the democracy. Uh, at this point, uh, let's start with raising the question of relationship between sovereignty, increasing nationalism and the law. In these regimes, uh, nationalism play an important role in assembling a new space for governing. The national character of the state is reclaimed. Uh, which offers new imaginaries of democracy, rule of law, and human rights. But, uh, Margot Jetta, are those principles and standards a uh, national matter only? Thank you very much, Ozem, for the introduction and this very thought-provoking um question also thank you to Hafiza Marquezi for organizing this event it's a pleasure to be here even virtually on the human rights day I wish we had a much more cheerful subject to discuss and um, I wish we could have actually some reasons to celebrate today however instead of that I'm afraid we have to um, take a look back and uh, grasp a very critical assessment of what happened um, First in Poland, I will just focus first on Poland, maybe later we'll go to the international trends, because I think it is important also for our audience to have a quick recap of what happened um, in Poland in recent years. So since the end of 2015, we uh, have been experiencing the worst uh, rule of law crisis since the Poland gained independence uh, in 19. 89. Uh, this rule of law crisis uh, has been developing on numerous platforms, but at this very highest level, this is nothing else like, like uh, simply just grasping the powers by the governing majority. In order to do so, the governing majority uh, crippled the independence of almost all institutions of check and balances, including courts, that was the first front of attack, but also prosecution, public media, and um, here's an important and information that media are not public anymore, they are national media, as many other institutions follow that path and change their names uh, from public to, to national um, institutions on the basis of the law decrees. But also, uh, the governing majority uh, try to weaken the position of all the elected institutions, like, for example, the parliament. Uh, right now, the main governing uh, center and the center of decisions lays with the leadership of the party outside the parliament. Of course, it was also the process of undermining the role of the opposition, uh, to a certain extent, extent also the, the president and also the government. Um, it's very... Uh, on that, I would just mention that it's very, I would say, interesting uh, how uh, the laws are right now adopted in Poland without any serious consultations with experts. The, the legislation is being pushed um, through uh, the government, uh, sorry, through the parliament uh, without any um, without any critical assessment. And many of the democratic rules are right now being bent to uh, the political will in order to um, secure the political interests of the governing majority. Now, coming back to your um, question regarding the uh, connection between the concepts of sovereignty, populism, and nationalism, I would say that those issues go um, hand in hand right now, even though they seem to be remotely distanced between each other. However, um, many of the changes that were introduced in the system of the state in the last five years were actually uh, justified by the law and justice and the governing majority winning in the parliamentary elections. In, on many occasions, we could have heard the representatives of the governing majority saying simply like this, since we won the elections, since the war, a sovereign nation vested power into us, we are free to push all of those changes. And such a statement was supposed to 
actually cut any discussions about it, uh, about the fact whether those changes are actually in compliance with the constitution, other, other, whether they are in compliance with the democratic rules, uh, whether there is, whether finally those uh, those changes are legal. Um, simply, the rule of law was replaced by ruling. Uh, by law. And it's also underpinned with a lot of uh, nationalistic rhetorics. So uh, the governing majority actually appeals to the very um, worst understood and interpret uh, nationalistic demons in the society. And it takes a form of numerous uh, campaigns against certain groups, like, for example, LGBT persons, but also migrants, we, who has been um, and the scapegoat uh, in the political uh, discussion in the region for the last couple of years. Uh, but also there are, um, uh, this rhetoric is also the anti-gender anti rhetoric uh, and the discussion on withdrawing with the Istanbul Convention. So simply sending the message to the victims of domestic violence that this is just a, some sort of a gender ide ideology and not uh, and not the actual um and not the actual problem here so those problems of uh, human rights as you said in the beginning this are not the process i would say it's not the process of contesting the idea of human rights but ra rather replacing human rights with different values uh with the values of um understood as the uh very specific mixture or uh, mixture of traditional catholic church uh but also re religious and some sort and, and just a hint of nationalism um uh, values that are put together and in in that melting pot and pot and presented as the entire ideology of this governing majority so instead of uh, instead of redefining human rights we have just the process of uh replacing them by by the very traditional um but very wrongly inter traditionally interpreted uh values that simply uh means for the certain groups of people uh, that that they being um, uh, prone to discrimination and the rights are prone to uh, to breaching, and at the at the end of the day, it also weakens the entire democratic system of the state, meaning that all of those function independent institutions are not independent anymore, and they are just um, under the control of the governing majority. So this is the process we observed in in last five years in a nutshell. Unfortunately, and I know we also will talk about the future later on, but mm -hmm. I can say it already that um, nothing uh, seems to stop this process from developing. Um, thank you. Uh, I want to stay on this topic, uh, continuing with Turkish contexts, but uh, while turning to Turkish contexts, uh, I would like to refer to the Article 90 of the Turkish Constitution, uh, which establishes the supremacy of the international human rights conventions uh, over national legislation. Uh, Article 90 of the Turkish Constitution has been amended to include such a provision in 2004. And one of the main purposes uh, for this amendment in general was to elevate the uh, standards of human rights to meet with the Copenhagen political uh, criteria. Well, as things stand today, uh, what uh, happened to this so-called silent revolution in the Turkish constitutional system? Because uh, what we have been observing in Turkey is more or less have similarities with what Malgojata just uh, briefly summarized. Thank you, Özlem, and thank you for inviting me to this interesting uh, uh, workshop. Um, what happened to Article 19 and the silent revolution? Uh, first of all, the silent, even si the concept of silent, silent revolution, uh, I think, is a, an old concept now because the government used to uh, refer this is a silent revolution a couple of years ago, uh, but I don't uh, hear uh, this notion uh, in uh, recent times. 
Uh, in 2004, it was just two years after uh, AKP came into power and its strategies uh, in its power struggle with the uh, state was different. It needed support of the European Union uh, and other actors which could strengthen government against uh, established powers in the state. So uh, it was a good idea to insert this uh, provision uh, to the constitution uh, to look sympathetic, to uh, draw some support from uh, Western partners. Uh, however, when you insert this, this becomes a provision of constitution and it uh, affects the hierarchy of uh, different rules uh, in the national law. And as you stated, Article 19 uh, states that when there's a conflict between national laws and international treaties relating to human rights, human rights treaties should uh, prevail. Uh, but uh, is this the case? Uh, let's see uh, what happened. First of all, I think uh, we need to uh, separate European Convention on Human Rights from all other uh, human rights treaties, UN treaties, other Council of Europe treaties, and so on. Uh, there's a legal reason for that, uh, because uh, the Constitutional Court examines individual applications according to the European Convention, not to other uh, human rights treaties. But also, uh, there, there are political reasons uh, for that. Uh, when you fail in domestic law, you generally, uh, Turkish uh, human rights victims, apply to the European Convention on Human Rights. And as all we know, it's the most effective uh, human rights protection uh, mechanism. Uh, that's why, uh, first of all, we need to... Uh, distinguish other human rights treaties from European Convention on Human Rights. Um, very recently, I joined uh, another workshop organized by Koch University. It was about the implementation of UN treaties. And we, we, we had several expert speakers on different UN treaties. Uh, the general observation of that uh, workshop was that um, UN treaties uh, are being mostly ignored by uh, the Turkish judicial authorities at, as well as administration. Uh, one exception might be um, Children's Rights Convention and partly uh, CEDAW. Uh, but for instance, um, uh, International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights are very rarely uh, invoked by the Turkish judicial authorities. And um, on the contrary, uh, some of basic principles of the covenant are directly breached by uh, Turkish judiciary. One very good example that I used in that workshop is uh, the prohibition of war propaganda. Uh, a lot of people in Turkey are being prosecuted for asking for peace uh, the most prominent one, I guess, is uh, peace petitioners, but also there are other examples where people are being prosecuted for calling peace. For instance, the Board of Medical Associations Union uh, were convicted uh, for stating that uh, war is a public health uh, problem because they made this comment during Turkish invasion to uh, northern Syria, uh, and they were uh, convicted for inciting hatred uh, by uh, stating that uh, war uh, is a, a public health problem. Uh, so uh, considering that uh, war propaganda is uh, prohibited uh, under the covenant, it's not surprising that uh, the Turkish judiciary never uh, recalls uh, the jurisprudence of the Human Rights Committee or the Covenant itself. Uh, when we go back to the European Convention on Human Rights, as I said, this is, this is uh, the exception because uh, this is widely uh, cited by the Turkish judiciary and lawyers. 
uh, we see a different picture and strategy uh, to uh, to escape uh, from uh, the rulings of the European Court of Human Rights. First of all, um, yes, Turkish authorities uh, often cite to uh, European Convention and the jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights, but in most cases, this is just to justify what they do rather than to uh, rectify what they do. What I mean by that, for instance, uh, when it comes to terrorist propaganda cases, uh, there are hundreds of decisions that have been rendered against Turkey um, and in which uh, uh, the court decided that Turkish judicial authorities did not examine uh, the incitement to violence or the hatred in their decisions. Uh, courts ignore decisions that have been delivered against Turkey, by, but they keep citing uh, Zana versus Turkey, where exceptionally the uh, court found uh, the government uh, in favor of the government rather than the applicant. In that case, uh, we might remember that uh, former mayor of Diyarbakir made comments about the activities of PKK and uh, the European court taking uh, the political uh, role of the applicant as well as the context uh, he used the words in, in his interview found that Turkey did not violate uh, Article 10 of the Convention by convicting him. But this was an exceptional judgment. This exceptional judgment is the most cited uh, ECHR uh, case uh, in Turkish juris jurisprudence relating to terrorist propaganda. And another similar example is Otto Preminger Institute case. This is about uh, uh, conflict between freedom of expression and freedom of uh, religion. Uh, in that case, uh, the court decided in favor of the government uh, and uh, in a way uh, required applicant to respect uh, religious values of the majority. Uh, Turkish judicial uh, authorities refer to this a lot as they do in, in Zana versus Turkey. Minister of Interior, for instance, is referring Harry Batasuna versus Spain uh, when it uh, increases the pressure on HTP and the uh, pro-Kurdish uh, politicians uh, while ignoring all decisions of the European Court of Human Rights delivered against uh, Turkey. So this is the first effect rather than uh, positive, it's a very negative effect uh, on daily practice. Secondly, uh, in 2012, in addition to the amendment made in uh, uh, Article 19, an individual application mechanism was created uh, in the Constitution. So uh, before going to Strasbourg, you need to go to the Constitutional Court. And the Constitutional Court uh, examines complaints that falls within the ambit of the European Convention on Human Rights. So it doesn't directly apply the convention, but when it interprets the constitution, it takes uh, the convention jurisprudence uh, into consideration. But on the other hand, the constitutional court is working like a, bo a wall or a buffer zone uh, uh, before the applicants, uh, before they go to the European Court of Human Rights. And uh, again, I, I, I can give too many different examples, but I don't want to take a lot of time, just so uh, I'll give some uh, one or two brief examples. For instance, uh, since President Erdogan came into power as president in 2014, uh, judicial authorities initiated around 100,000 criminal investigations uh, under Article 299 of the Criminal Code. This is about insult the president. And uh, more than 30,000 people uh, have been prosecuted, and again, more than 10,000 people have been convicted under this uh, provision. And so far, 
the commission, uh, sorry, the, the section uh, of the Constitutional Court uh, has delivered just one judgment about insults of president, and this was against the applicant. Uh, and out of 30,000 um, cases, we don't know how many of them are still pending before uh, the Constitutional Court. So it's work, it works as a uh, great wall uh, before the European Court of Human Rights. And um, sometimes um, the, the Constitutional Court is using the jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights to uh, stop cases floating uh, to the court. I impunity cases is a good example of uh, this. Uh, the European Court previously uh, ruled that uh, if a person realizes that uh, there is no effective investigation about uh, right to life or um, prohibition of torture cases, then at the time of this awareness, they should apply to, to the European Court of Human Rights. And the uh, Constitutional Court, in an odd way, adapted this interpretation to the individual uh, application mechanism, which resulted that it says now that uh, if at the beginning of the individual complaint mechanism, you knew that uh, other uh, uh, national domestic mechanisms were not effective at that time, then you had to apply to the Constitutional Court in 2012. So when first uh, did the courts uh, say this in 2018. So the court required applicants to realize back in six years to apply to the constitutional court on the ground that uh, the other effectives were not uh, effective. And how did the constitutional do this? By relying on the jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights. Again, a very weird example how uh, the European Convention was used uh, against the uh, uh, applicant. And still, still, by the way, uh, the, the, the Constitutional Court referring to the jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights, but reaching completely a different uh, result. Let me give some, again, very well-known examples. Osman Kavala, uh, as you know, uh, in his case, the European Court decided that the Turkish government not only violated Article 55, but also Article 18, because it thought that there was a, a disguised purpose behind his detention. Uh, and it gave a lot of examples from the speeches of the president and uh, other attitudes of the uh, government. This case passed from the Constitutional Court, and the Constitutional Court didn't find any problem in Selahattin Demirtas, in uh, Jumriyet uh, newspapers, journalist case, Sabunji and others, in Ahmed Ship case. Uh, in, we, we can uh, count many more. So the Constitutional Court is reading the same convention, referring to the same jurisprudence, but reaching to a different uh, result. But even worse, after Bush versus Turkey case, it's a judgment about the uh, deprivation of liberty of a former judge, uh, the Constitutional Court openly rejected to implement the judgment of the uh, European Court of Human Rights. This is, a, uh, uh, I think, the first open challenge uh, to the jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights. And I think, so uh, maybe I can finish here for the first question, uh, next week's judgment uh, in, uh, I forgot the name of the case, but for the first time, the European Court will decide in a dismissal case, uh, uh, dismissal during state of emergency. And for the first time, the court will discuss whether the Turkish government, by a, a state of emergency decrees, created a new criminal provision that implemented retroactively. If uh, the European Court finds a violation in that case, then it will mean that uh, the Constitutional Court will have to respond this, not just in the judge's case once, but hundreds or thousands of times, and we will see. But uh, as a, as a uh, 
summary, I can say that the impact of uh, the ECHR um, insertion through Article 19 of the uh, Constitution uh, has been very limited, and generally, it, it has it, it, ha it has had a negative impact rather than positive. Uh, thank you. Uh, I thought the last points. Re uh, re related to constitutional courts' rejection of the implementation is worth mentioning once again. I think we will touch upon that point once uh, later. Uh, but at this point, I would like to talk about uh, when the fundamental values uh, at the heart of this international human rights regime are at stake, organizations like uh, European Union, Council of Europe, and uh, other international actors deal with this backsliding. Uh, maybe immediately, maybe in some time, adopt political and judicial measures as a response. Uh, however, we now uh, more and more see that uh, states criticize these actors and the me measures, claiming that they have gone too far. Uh, and further, they institutionalize um, criticism by uh, this criticism by certain ways, like uh, they can stop paying contributions, which is happening many times in terms of the Council of Europe, uh, or they declare to leave the system uh, and block the decision making processes with veto, which is recently Poland and Hungary. Uh, blocked the EU's budget and pandemic recovery package. Uh, well, Turkey is not an EU member. Uh, well, if so, and as things uh, stand today, highly possible Turkey will take side with Poland and Hungary in this picture. Uh, as a common question uh, directed to you both, what do you think in this um, respect? I mean, to this kind of gambling, I have to say, effect on the future of the international human rights regime, because there are political measures and uh, states are institu institutionalized some kind of ways against these political measures. Uh, Malgojeta, maybe we can start with you once again. Thank you. Oh, wow. That's a hard question uh, when it comes to... Well, the first thing I need to say is that whenever I try to predict the future, uh, the future always proves me wrong. So <laughs> when I, that's the disclaimer at the beginning. And whatever there are my prognosis for the future of the European Union or Council of Europe, I do hope I'm wrong right now. But I just want to make a, a, po a reference to the point Karim made, uh, made uh, in his uh, statement when it comes to this... Um, Mel interpretation of the European Convention of Human Rights and how the national courts try to find them way, their ways to sanction a much more traditional nationalistic and populistic approach to, to those conventions. Well, I think we have two different problems here. The first problem is that uh, we always observe some sort of a dialogue between the national and international courts. And for example, that was the case in Poland when the decisions of the Constitutional Tribunal, when this uh, institution was independent back before 2015, uh, were contradictory or not entirely in line with the decisions of the European Court of Human Rights. And there was a lot of uh, room for work for the human rights um, activists to try to find a way how to advance the protection of human rights protection. And um, back then, we never thought of that as a sort of a you know, insult to the entire system of human rights protection. We we treated it as, as a obvious blow to uh, human rights protection. Uh, however, it still met in certain constitutional democratic standards. Right now, we are operating in a complete limbo because on the one hand, the Constitution Tribunal, which is fully captured the institution, um, Legally speaking, it's not the most prominent one, I would dare to say, given the quality of the latest decisions. Um, 
And this institution, which with such a weakened, not only independence, but also, I would say, brain power, um, uh, faces the challenge of interpreting the international law, including European, Co European Convention of Human Rights, but also European Union law. And if you ask me, this is the recipe for the catastrophe. And I, I was very preoccupied to see uh, to hear to Karim's um, examples of the cases that are misinterpreted um, of the European Convention of Human Rights, because I do believe that uh, in the future we will also see um, the raising wave of similar decisions uh, from Poland, and it's. Fascinating for lawyers to observe this kind of tango right now, which is no longer dialogue. This is rather some sort of a box match <laughs> between those those two tribunals, because there is this dynamic of the rule of law crisis in Poland. Whenever there is the a court of justice of the European Union upcoming decisions concerning certain elements of the reform of the judiciary or, or changes in the Polish judiciary, uh, we can see either the government some sort of backpedaling and reversing some of those changes, or we see the constitutional tribunal being plugged in and actually making the decisions that are contrary to what the, the what the European Court of Justice uh, said or may may say. So uh, there are certain motions that are already directed to the constitutional tribunal, and they simply await for the moment when uh, the constitutional tribunal is going to render the ruling that would be. Um, it, not in compliance with what the European Court, what the Court of Justice of the European Union um, would say. Now, coming back to your, so this is, um, and uh, the other thing, which is, I think, um, very symptomatic for both Poland and Turkey, is that um, those governing majorities adopted a strategy of. Um, collision course with the international institutions. Instead of uh, looking for the consensus or bringing their own ideas to the table, uh, we only observe the trend of the so-called negative agenda. So the only thing that those countries actually bring in, in, the, in the cooperation is certain, is no, as you said at the beginning, veto to any, any of uh, the proje projects that could actually advance the protection of human rights, democracy, and, and the rule of law. There are different reasons behind that. I'm not going to get into that right now. However, uh, it's like if you have the classroom full of pupils, there's all, all, always the one troublemaking. And that's why this is the case of those two or a couple more even countries in, in those international institutions. Now, when it comes to the response of those institutions towards, um, towards those troublemaking countries, from the experience of Poland, I could say that vast majority of all of the reaction mechanisms and i put it as a very broad notion for all for both political and judicial um decisions uh they started with the political will and there has to be some sort of a political decision to actually push forward with those problems because as we can see for example in the case of hungary if you build your coalitions very smartly and you join the right clubs then um um, then the punishing, maybe not even punishing, but even discussing uh, the violations of the rule of law in a given country is much more complicated when in the situation when the government decides to isolate themselves on their own will. Uh, having said that, I also would say that um, from the political perspective, actually, none of those political measures actually led to any sort of um, retreat, uh, maybe not retreat, um, uh, the governing majority changing their minds on certain issues. The only effective tools were actually decisions of the Court of Justice of the European Union, because in case of failing to implement those decisions, um, the country can be uh, financially sanctioned. And this is not the political process. This is the process of the court adjudicating of the sanctions. So it would be very difficult for the governing majority to actually spin around those problems and say that this is the rotten Western Union who uh, tries to punish us, that would be actually the court decision. And that would end the um, end the story here. However, on the other hand, we still don't have any decisions concerning the European Court of Human Rights that would decide on individual cases the, uh, of individuals who are actually 
who bore the consequences of the changes to the judiciary system, neither judge nor the individual applicants. Of course, the Astrid Sons case um, of last month, but also the case Karen mentioned concerning the dismissal of a judge during the state of emergency, uh, set a nice, um, set an interesting framework for the potential cases from Poland, but given the pace of the works of the, Euro of the European Court of Human Rights, I believe we still have to uh, wait for those decisions. Ah, and that very long introduction <laughs> leads me finally to answer the question regarding the future of those uh, of those two institutions. Maybe uh, I would just focus for the um, firstly on the European Union. Um, the one thing that uh, the European Commission, the one lesson definitely the European Commission drew from this crisis in Poland is that many of those um, mechanisms that are already in place are just reactive to the problems. Uh, there is no preventive mechanism. That's the one thing. And the second thing is even those reactive mechanisms are very weak uh, if the governing if the governing party in question does not want to obey to those rules. Um, so there is this ongoing discussion what to do more to prevent situations like that. And the European Commission, this one, came up with this idea of the preventive mechanism of monitoring the rule of law protection across the countries. However, even though it's a very interesting outcomes of those of uh, this research and this monitoring, it can be for the rule of law geeks. However, it's still, however, it's a little bit naive to think that the report could uh, prevent uh, those changes from happening. So on the one hand, we have a huge body of uh, evidence concerning the rule of law violations, especially in Poland or, or Hungary, and certain symptoms in countries that may try to follow that lead or consider it somehow. Uh, and on the other hand, we all only have something that is called the nuclear Nuclear option equal seven that is um, that is uh, sanction mechanism um, uh, ripping of the country from um, the voting uh, the voting rights in the uh, European Council uh, and there is very little in between so uh, that's that's the, the the foundation for that was the belief that since the European Union is the institution based of based on the consensus and the and the dialogue, um, the countries will always at least agree on the Article 2 values, on the very fundamental values, and the rest will be the part of the negotiations. However, right now we are in the moment when uh, those governments, uh, Polish and Hungarian governments, try to negotiate something that was the, fundam the fundamental for, for the Union, namely the values such as democracy, rule of law, and, and human rights protection. Um, the financial mechanism that Poland and Hungary opposed to, right now given the latest information and most probably they have changed their mind, is some sort of finding something in between those reactive and preventive mechanisms. And this is actually just um, adding a stick to the, all of those discipline mechanisms. However, again, this mechanism um, has been watered down and has been very weakened uh, in comparison to what was proposed uh, in the beginning of this process two years ago. Uh, that means that uh, the European Union still has to find a way how to deal with the autocrats within the European Union. But the question is whether this particular commission would sign up for the challenge. Because the another option is that um, to live uh, with those mechanisms we have right now and try to um, redefine the cooperation within the European Union. And instead of uh, 27 countries that were equal partners, try to, um, in practice, it may lead to the situation when only the particular groups of countries work together, whereas those troublemaking countries are left um, are left isolated, and that would be uh, the worst consequences of um, the Polish uh, uh, rule of law crisis, and that would be an absolute um, crisis in the Polish diplomatic relations and the and their international position. Now, when it comes to Council of Europe, I think um, Council of Europe is the institution who had a lot of problems, even without those troubling making countries. Um, but um, uh, I still think that there is a 
um, lots of to be done, especially when it comes to the monitoring uh, uh, procedures. Those procedures could have been used um, earlier in a more swift um, uh, manner and uh, in a bigger number of, of uh, countries, depending on, on the situation then. But this is exactly the, uh, the political problem. However, when it comes to the like the crown jewelry of the European uh, of the Council of Europe, which is the European Court of Human Rights. I think we have to focus on the discussion on implementation of the decisions of the European Court of Human Rights. The discussion in the Council of Ministers is the one mechanism, but I think uh, these issues has to be internalized also at the national level, and only depending on that uh, we can uh, we can see how the future of the Council of Europe would develop. Thank you. Uh, well, Turkey is not uh, EU member, but uh, this gambling has been played on the Council of Europe uh, playground by Turkey um, quite a lot. Uh, would you like to add something, Kira, on this point? <laughs> and the future of the international human rights regime, of course. Yes. Um, I mean, uh... Um, I, I'm, I'm luckier than Mal Gorzetta uh, because I will just talk on uh, uh, Council of Europe, but Turkish government, uh, I think now, uh, has a very um, uh, active player, uh, is a very active player in the Council of Europe, so I think there are many things to say. First of all, uh, I think uh, we shouldn't only talk about hard tools that are being used by this populist government. They use both hard and soft uh, tools in their games, and they use it sometimes with other authoritarian governments together. They collaborate, and sometimes they play the game directly with the institution uh, to which they are a member of. So uh, we have two different tools and two different uh, actors to play. Uh, first of all, just remember that uh, Turkey, uh, maybe it's not a member of EU, but using this hard tools sometimes, uh, as happened in uh, uh, following uh, the uh, reception of Vaclav Havel Prize by a former dismissed, dismissed Turkish judge. Turkey cuts its financial support to to the Council of Europe following the uh, Parliamentary Assembly's uh, award to, um, to the Turkish judge. So it might happen. But uh, in addition to this, Turkey learned to how to cooperate with other uh, authoritarian populist governments, both at the UN and the Council of Europe. So when you see any discussion about Turkey, you will see that a lot of Azerbaijan uh, members of the parliaments take the floor and talk on behalf of the Turkish government. And the procedure before PACE is very interesting. I mean, if you first go and ask for the order, then you speak a lot. And a very similar uh, tactic also plays at the universal uh, review process uh, at the United Nations, uh, this um, authoritarian populist governments ask each other to, to talk to support the other one uh, at the review process. So uh, people who f for the first time uh, that review that uh, had a chance to watch universal periodic review, were shocked by uh, the support of some governments to Turkey, whilst uh, many others could only say fevers uh, at the end. So this is one of the strategies, working with other populist governments, voting uh, with other uh, populist governments. Uh, secondly, uh, uh, the election of members of institutions. The, the most important one is the judge of national judge uh, that uh, is selected on behalf of uh, that government. We call it national uh, judge, but we don't expect that person to be representing the government. 
when a person is uh, appointed uh, as a judge to the court, then that person should uh, act independently. Uh, however, uh, this is not happening anymore. A lot of uh, populist governments are forcing uh, pays to elect someone close to the government. Uh, the pays uh, develop some uh, methods to prevent government to impose or uh, to force the pace to elect the uh, judge that is uh, requested by the government, by uh, gender equality requirements, by uh, equality of the quality between uh, the members requirement. But the result is, in Turkish case, uh, the pace couldn't elect a judge for two years and finally elected someone uh, I mean, from Turkish perspective, who is representing the government at the court rather than acting as an independent member. And this is happening more and more for other uh, judges as well. Uh, also, this strategy works uh, uh, in the closed door uh, discussions with the uh, members of those institutions. For instance, uh, Turkey uh, successfully prevented pays to initiate a monitoring uh, process against Turkey in January 2017. Later that year, uh, the monitoring process started, but uh, Turkey with this uh, shuttle uh, policy with the Council of Europe and its Secretary General, achieved to delay at least this, this process. And uh, since uh, the monitoring started, what happened at the Council of Europe? Very limited uh, happened, and that's why I think this is this is the second strategy uh, at uh, at the Council of Europe. Internally, uh, I don't know the situation in Poland. Uh, maybe Malgorasa can uh, inform us on this. But Turkey is investing huge uh, sources to human rights bureaucracy, not to protect human rights, but to show and defend the government outside the country. So uh, about the implementation of the judgments of the European Court of Human Rights, the Turkish Ministry of Justice uh, unendingly sending documents to the Committee of Ministers to prove that uh, they implement the judgments. It's happening in a similar way at the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, the government is providing two uh, many different documents to the court to delay uh, the judicial process or in some cases to drop the case. Uh, and this is, this is done very strategically because when you control the judiciary, you can get any decision anytime you want to present uh, to the uh, international uh, institutions. And uh, one, one last thing about this coalition thing, um, the, as I said, uh, this authoritarian and populist regimes act together at international institutions. Normally, you wouldn't expect uh, Orban uh, loving Erdogan and Erdogan uh, admiring Orban, but their interests are common. Um, Orban is a Islamophobic uh, person and uh, Erdogan is blaming the Europeans, for instance, Macron, for uh, acting the interest of uh, Muslims in Europe. But they can act very friendly at international uh, institutions uh, because they, they, they want to water down the quality of uh, human rights protection in those institutions. So I think um, we shouldn't only take the hard tools by uh, preventing those institutions to work by cutting financial resources or uh, by using vetoes uh, about taking decisions. We should also uh, consider other ways of uh, policies conducted by uh, those uh, regimes uh, at the uh, international institutions. This also affects uh, the human rights protection provided by those institutions. Uh, 
Well, th thank you. Uh, so far, um, from each of your uh, responses, I have uh, some topics uh, which I think worth uh, more uh, digging uh, there. Uh, Margot Jatsa, you recently mentioned in your uh, last response uh, that there is kind of a, a differentiation with the judicial context and the political context. These, I mean, EU is uh, pursuing against uh, Poland. And um, there was a recent uh, report titled Rule of Law in Poland 2020, uh, International and European Responses to the Crisis. I would like to quote from there. Uh, quote, the European Union has not sufficiently used its tools to combat the crisis. Uh, while judicial measures employed by the, by the Court of Justice effectively prevented the situation from getting worse, political tools such as Article 7.1 have been watered down and require improvements, end of the quote. Well, this was uh, like you mentioned, you uh, said that there is a problem with the Article 7.1 and uh judicial measures employed by the uh, court of justice have some different respect well uh so far we uh, summarize the situation and of the rule of law in uh, poland so uh it comes to mind that uh, what is the reason behind the ease of applying uh, judicial measures against poland i mean if at all uh, because we are uh, mentioning about the reactions of the government to measures. So is there a is, isn't there a reaction to this judicial measures? Or uh, if not, what is the reason? Well, I think first of all that um, uh, the, the response to the ju judicial measures uh, applied the, to the decisions of the European Court of, of Justice of the Euro mm, um, is um, is a little bit more complicated. Is that um, there is certain appetite from the common courts in Poland, from the domestic courts, to actually have more guidelines from the Luxembourg on how to approach the certain elements of the changes in the judiciary system. And um, uh, it's, it's also a very significant change because uh, up to 2015, 2017, uh, the Polish courts were very reluctant in asking the Luxembourg court for any preliminary ruling in case concerning, um, in case involving the implementation of the European Union law. However, when uh, the crisis deepened and it turned out that the guidelines, uh, I, I say it guidelines, but the decisions being made by the European Court um, could actually be helpful in terms of remedy certain situations, the courts gain more and more courage to ask for these uh, preliminary rulings. And um, here's, the, here's the one obstacle. Um, First, you need a judge and you need a national court who actually would initiate the procedure of asking the CJEU about the certain interpretation of a given case. Uh, secondly, uh, are also the internal obstacles. Of course, not all the cases would be qualified for the Court of Justice to rule on that. You need to have this very strong link between the pending case and the European Union law. And some of those already made requests has been uh, struck down by the Court of Justice on that grounds that there is this the particular case did not fall under the competence of the European Union law. Um, but on the other hand, uh, from the governing majority perspective, there is this huge mechanism that would prevent the judges from this such a, a brave, broad, pro-rule of law interpretation of law and down the situations. I'm speaking here about uh, the regime of the disciplinary proceedings against judges. Right now, um, 
I don't want to get into details because it can be a little bit convoluted what happened in the last two years. But the bottom line is that if there is, uh, first of all, there is no guarantees for judges' independence in Poland right now. And secondly, any decision that is in favor to the governing majority could be responded by the disciplinary commissioners nominated by the Minister of Justice with the disciplinary actions. So... It takes not only a lot of like legal thinking and analysis to to ask the court of justice to interpret certain situations, but it also takes a lot of bravery and courage from uh, from those judges to actually in, in, to uh, to do it. The situation is slightly better when it comes to those proceedings started by the European Commission, in which uh, the Court of Justice um, rules upon as the result of the infringement proceeding, proceeding launched by the European Commission. Here, here there's also the problem with initiating this proceeding because you need that political consent to start it. Uh, but then uh, the judgment of the in, in Court of Justice has been extremely important to remedy the situation and the rule of a law crisis uh, in Poland. Uh, yet again, the problem is that, that, first of all, it takes a lot of time. And secondly, some of those decisions were actually no longer valid because, in as I said in the beginning, uh, the government anticipating certain of those decisions um, just changed uh, the law that has been changed and challenged in the proceedings before the Court of Justice. Of course, those final ch changes are still the window dressing and it does not fully remedy the situation. We are far from a situation where can, when we could say that the rule of law in Poland is fully protected. It's not the case and it won't be a case for, for many years to come, actually. However, uh, those, uh, those uh, judicial... Um, reactions are extremely important uh, because at the end of the day it not only uh, helps in the current situation but it also sets um, uh, set certain standards of the protection of the independence of judiciary across the European Union. The sad observation for me as a um, Polish lawyer and it really breaks my heart is that um, it is Poland who actually started this process. And it is uh, thanks to the situation in Poland that the Court of Justice of the European Union has to deal with those problems. Thank you very much. Uh, from this point, I would like to jump to Turkish case. Uh, and uh, as Kerem uh, in this relation, but uh, also, I, uh, I would like to remind that I'm not the one only asking the questions. Uh, audience can uh, feel free to ask any uh, questions or just submit their comments that we can also uh, talk uh, over these comments. Uh, uh, at this point, uh, yeah, we uh, heard uh, really good uh, points from the uh, Malgorzats on the the uh, European Court of Justice uh, within the EU. Uh, but we have, uh, and uh, earlier, uh, as Cam, you said, European Human Rights Convention uh, is the most effective human rights mechanism. You have kind of a remark uh, on that. Uh, well, it is the, one of the uh, frameworks establishing the certain standards for human rights protection and safeguarding the principles of rule of law. Um, in case of Turkey, Turkey is a member of the Council of Europe, uh, also one of the founding members, uh, has ratified the European Convention uh, already in 1954 then recognized the compulsory jurisdiction of the European Court of Human Rights in 1990. So uh, when we think that the power of the European Court of Human Rights relies on the large extent on the binding force of the uh, European Convention, um, can we say that uh, European Convention is the law of the land in Turkey? I mean, because we are talking about a country with significant and persistent uh, rule of law issues. And also, um, in connected with this question, uh, is the European Court of Human Rights is capable of adding layers to the human rights protection uh, in case of Turkey, 
maybe in a wider lens uh, in any other jurisdiction? Uh, thank you, Islam. Um, I mean, uh, I think the, for the first time I will be using this in English, uh, my famous or infamous concept of uh, Occidental and Oriental lies thing. Uh, I use this uh, concept uh, in a Turkish uh, conference and I said that uh, Turkey used to lie in an o uh, Oriental way in uh, uh, 1919s, when Turkey first recognized the uh, compulsory jurisdiction of the European Court of Human Rights, Turkish bureaucracy did not know how to play with the European Court of Human Rights. And uh, the court was new for uh, everyone because uh, the first Turkish judgment, which was delivered in 1991, was uh, number 310th uh, of the court, considering that uh, every year the court delivers thousands of cases uh, nowadays. Uh, the court was also uh, new at that time. And Turkey was lying in an oriental way uh, at that time. What I mean by that, Turkey was denying everything, refusing everything. I mean, uh, we didn't take that person into custody. We didn't disappear that person. That was the response. And when the government uh, was asked about the documents relating to, to the case, they didn't have anything to present because they, they, they didn't think at that time that that documents would be asked at some time in future. However, in the process, as I tried to explain today, Turkey learned to lie in an occidental way. What I mean by that, now Turkey explains everything with legal concepts, produces uh, hundreds of thousands of pages of documents for everything. So it's another way uh, for uh, 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 playing the game. It's, it's This new tactic and new approach has, of course, uh, domestic impacts as well. Turkey keeps changing its law, referring to, to the jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights. But is there a real change in the life lives of people that's the question uh, for instance as i stated at the beginning one of the most decided problems about turkey is terrorist propaganda cases there are tens or hundreds of judgments of the european court of human rights in total turkish anti-terror law have been amended 12 times sorry uh, 10 times about this provision. Three times Article 8 of the anti-terror law. This was uh, about propaganda against indivisibility of the state. Then finally, the government decided to abolish that provision. Then court started to punish people under Article 7, Paragraph 2, terrorist propaganda. This provision has been amended six times after the abolishment of uh, Article 8. And the result is, in 2017, there were 24,000 cases uh, initiated before the courts. 24,000 people were prosecuted in 2017 under this provision. It, it didn't change anything. For the last three years, more than a million people have been investigated under Article uh, 314 of the uh, Turkish criminal codes, which is about um, membership to terrorist organization. Many of those people uh, have never seen a weapon in their life. They've been uh, uh, investigated for tweeting, for writing articles, for having a bank account, and so on. So uh, the impact even in the uh, most decided um, areas are limited. Another example to show whether uh, the European Convention of Human Rights is the law of the land. Uh, Turkey is the leading country in Article 10 cases, but it's had to have with Russia in Article 2 and 3 cases, because uh, in 1980s, then 1990s, 
uh, serious and grave human rights violations uh, have been uh, realized in Turkey. And those uh, who committed those crimes uh, have never been taken uh, before the courts. And uh, in a number of cases, the European Court of Human Rights decided against Turkish government uh, on the ground that it failed to effectively investigate those crimes. What happened? Not a single individual who was responsible for those crimes uh, have been convicted. Uh, either those cases uh, uh, were dropped due to statute of limitation, or those people were acquitted on the ground that uh, there, were, there wasn't enough uh, evidence to convict uh, those uh, people. So uh, as a result, uh, the second most important uh, area of uh, law that might affect uh, the daily life, impunity, did not change whatsoever. And Turkish government, following the coup attempt, uh, enacted new laws to provide protection to uh, state officials who might have committed uh, human rights violations during state of emergency and before state of emergency. So uh, no one has been convicted, so no individual result, and still impunity uh, is the law of the land, not the convention, so there are no general measures either. So what I believe that uh, this requires us, I think then the next question might be that, to think about the court, to think about the convention, uh, to think about how to really effectively implement uh, international standards in uh, domestic sphere. Well, uh, thank you. Uh, it has been more than an hour and uh, I don't want to let the audience with that negative uh, impressions on this important day. Uh, I know both of you are working on uh, defending the and upholding the human rights. Personally, I had uh, chances to work and exchange individually and apart uh, with you. Um, well, I, I would like to uh, raise a question of where to go from here but uh, of course uh, this question includes uh, what would be the best ways to work together to advance the imp uh, implementation of this difficult to implement european court of human rights judgments first national then international level I have to begin with Kerem, I guess. Uh, okay, then <laughs> uh, I can go where I left. Um, first of all, I think um, our discussion today uh, provides us some clues. As I stated, uh, the governments, populist governments, learn how to cooperate with each other, how to lobby at international institutions. So we need to draw some lessons from this. We, we need more cooperation internationally with uh, NGOs around the continent and the world. And we should act and support each other uh, before international institutions. This is, this is the first step. We have to learn from the government how to lobby, how to act together, how to fight together. That's the first point, I think. Secondly, uh, since the beginning of 2000s, th there is this concept of reforming the court. Uh, civil society, I believe, uh, hasn't played a, a relevant role in this process. That's why governments kept pushing court to the corner. And it's high time for civil society to ask for a real reform because 
uh, our governments controlling judiciary and those judiciaries, as I tweeted today, deciding 15 minutes to detain individuals. Then to undo this wrong, we fight for five, 10 years before international courts to get that person to be released. So an alternative quick uh, response is required. And I think in having this in mind, a reform at the European course level uh, needs to be discussed. Thirdly, I think this uh, uh, procedural review uh, methodology adopted by the court and owned by the president of the court should be left, at least for countries uh, who are not respecting uh, conventions values uh, as uh, others. Uh, the court should decide in critical cases very quickly uh, to guide uh, both national authorities as well as force international other organs to implement judgments. I think the Kavala judgment is a good example of this and it's very exceptional uh, in which Committee of Ministers is acting faster than uh, that we, we used to know. So that, that's another way. So the reform of the court in favor of uh, the applicants rather than the state. I know that, that this is difficult, but uh, uh, to overcome difficulties, we first need to uh, put this uh, item into our uh, 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 agenda. Uh, and uh, I think the, the, the fourth thing is to mainstreaming human rights movement. Uh, uh, I can, of course, comment on, uh, on Poland, but I, but I think in Turkey we have this problem. Mainstreaming human rights movement to reach uh, wider uh, public groups is a crucial uh, element to change the attitude of the governments. And uh, I think uh, we have failed uh, in this um, for many years now. I don't know again how to change this, but this is another point we need to discuss and develop uh, in the coming future. Uh, thank you. Uh, I would look. Uh, I would like to turn to Malgorjata with uh, a comment from the audience, Don Bermek. Um, well, he noted that we uh, should work together in every country to uh, follow the correct and just implementation of the judgments. So uh, uh, he's referring to collaboration and exchange also. Uh, what would you like to add? Um, yeah, I get a feeling that we could spend uh, we could organize another debate on this issue of implement of the proper implementing of um, the judgment of the court of a uh, European Court of Human Rights. I also believe that this is some of the issue in in Turkey as well. So there is a lot of room to explore the cooperation. And I just want to echo Karim's point that I absolutely agree that we need much more cooperation uh, and also learning from each other. Um, as the governments do it these days. Uh, when it comes to um, the implementation of, of the judgments, I think that uh, one thing it is desperately needed right now is some sort of the import of uh, best practices from other countries. And um, there is, uh, I observe it also at the experience from my organization when we learned in a hard way that the, the, the successful decision by the Strasbourg court is just the middle of the way and it's still a lot of to be done at the national level to finally said that certain problem was resolved and it took a lot of research monitoring and advocacy efforts to actually start the discussion however we still haven't received um, a positive systemic impact so uh, there is usually in that cycle cycle we observe a lot of discussion after the decision especially if the decision concerns highly politicized issues like for example I don't know, one of the most uh, discussed um, judgments of the European Court 
uh, of human rights was the case in the CIA rendition program in Poland, uh, but also abortion rights, for example. This is uh, these are also highly debated issues. Uh, but these judgments come and go, and uh, there is a very low political critical thinking of how, what to do with them right now next. So I think. Um, but this is also the effort that cannot be done only by the human rights organizations. We need a strong coalition of organizations and stakeholders, both at the national and international level, who would actually push for that issue and put it on the, on the priority list and on, on the top of the uh, of the agenda. Um, when I'm talking about the best practices, I think uh, one of them is, for example, the bringing the discussion about the implementation of human uh, of the decisions of the um, Strasbourg Court at the parliamentary level uh, to force MPs to think of that and to find a way how to implement the judgments in, uh, in the systemic way. Uh, the another issue is also some sort of a working collaboration between civil society organizations and bar associations where um, how to make the convention really a living instrument and how to quote certain of those standards that would could have been used by the lawyers while uh, the litigation. And finally, uh, one of the biggest um, challenge is actually convince the court to use the convention in a way it is written and interpreted by, by the Strasbourg court and also to avoid the situation that Karim explained uh, in detail, which is which was misinterpretation of the judgments and of the convention. I mean, in the last five years in Poland, we saw co uh, courts uh, be looking far and more and more often to the international standards, including the uh, European Convention of Human Rights. But still, uh, from the discussions with judges, we are still confronted with some single out but yet uh statements in which the, the judges say um we we never use the european convention of human rights we simply don't follow it we have different ways of uh, resolving issues and there's no point in looking into the standards right now this is um this is not a very often approach but uh, still you can find um in the discussion with certain judges with some judges uh who especially those who has never got a politicized case and uh, who are adjudicated in, in smaller courts or have never actually received any training on, on human rights in that regard, that they, uh, that they may see uh, the convention not as a useless instrument. I wouldn't say that, but simply as a not the most effective one. So there is a lot of thing, uh, lots of work to be done also in the terms of the cooperation here. Well, uh, thank you. Uh, I would like to turn to the audience's any comments and questions. And there is a question for um, Kerem raised by Ekin Ece Özgürdal. Uh, what do you think about the regulation which divides the bar association and uh, allows to have multiple bars in Turkey, uh, which is a topic for us here in Turkey. Uh, will it politicize the judiciary, which is already struggling in this sense? Um, thank you for this question. Uh, it's a very fresh uh, topic, by the way, because this morning the Constitutional Court uh, delivered its decision about uh, the request of an uh, on the attorneyship law brought by the uh, main opposition party and uh, it's a terrible judgment by the way uh, because uh, it ignores its own jurisprudence as well as uh, values protected by the constitution but from now on it's the law and uh, it works i mean the venice commission report report as well as icj human rights watch joins q a uh, perfectly uh, answers this question and uh, in the latter one, I was one of the authors, uh, we try to explain the risks created by this uh, division. The first thing, as you know very well, uh, now lawyers uh, who will be the members of pro-government uh, law associations and uh, anti government uh, law associations. This will uh, enact 
inescapably uh, will affect uh, the quality of uh, equality before before the courts. Judges will know uh, from which law association you're coming from. So it will affect uh, their decision because in turn, uh, judges and prosecutors boards, members of all which are appointed by the government, uh, will decide about the judge who decides against the lawyer that represents pro-government bar association. So this is inevitable. However, I think another point which which uh, which is missing uh, in in the comments uh, generally made uh, by observers is that um, I'm I'm the chair of Human Rights Center of Ankara Bar Association, and uh, for the last two years we reported uh, about abductions in Ankara. Uh, generally, we could do this through the lawyers that. Uh, were working on behalf of the fam families or uh, who had a chance to go to police station uh, under the legal aid scheme. scheme. Uh, from now on, there will be two bar associations in Ankara and Istanbul. And according to law, uh, their members will be treated equally in legal aid, uh, under the legal aid scheme, which means that uh, in those cases, it's highly likely that the government's bar associations lawyers will be uh, appointed. And unlike what we did in the abduction cases, in enforced disappearance cases, they might uh, hide uh, the, the uh, incidents that take place in uh, police custody. So uh, not only before the courts, but at the police stations, protections of individuals might decrease due to this amendment. And unfortunately, it's impossible to prove this. While writing uh, our Q&A, and you can see the same thing in Venice Commission, it's quite difficult to find an international standard on this. The government, that's why I say, okay, I mean, uh, we have a discretion, margin of appreciation in regulating uh, the legal profession in this way or that way. But on, on, on the field for human rights defenders, the reason is clear. And, and I think we can prove that this reason uh, by showing that Despite all arguments of the government, uh, the second bar association could not be established in Ankara. The government was claiming that there are too many lawyers complaining about uh, the despotic regime of, of the uh, bar associations. But the result is that uh, people are not leaving uh, the bar association. So as a final word, I think we cannot isolate what happens about uh, attorneyship law from the general tendencies of the government. This is a hegemonic uh, government, and a hegemonic government wants to control everything, including bar associations. With fair and democratic elections, there is no way that they can win uh, the elections at Ankara Bar Association, Istanbul Bar Association, and the only way is to split them to weaken them uh, and uh, to control them. So this this is this is the main purpose uh, behind uh, this regulation. And if we read it correctly, then there will be implications from this intention. Uh, once again, thank you for uh, this stimulating conversation, both of you. Um, we came to the end uh, and we also like to thank to the audience tuning in and staying us uh, this afternoon and night, depending on the time zone, I have to say. Uh, and last but not least, we thank you to the technical team making this broadcast available and also the translators. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Goodbye. Oh, yeah.